This week on The Arthropologist, I'm interviewing George Bassey with the Lauren Rogers Museum. Hey, George. Hey, good morning. How are you? I am well. How are you doing? I am doing great. Fantastic. Well, I'll have to tell you, I'm really, really jealous. I, I love the Lauren Rogers. It is one of my favorite museums. It is just so wonderful. I'm very well, jealous. I wish I were there with you. <laughs> well, hey, in, in any other time, we could have done this with you here, I guess. But hey, this is fun for me, and I appreciate you uh, uh, letting me call in to do it. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to, you know, we're just going and get started. And I do want you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself, but also then after you do that, tell us a little bit about the museum, because what's so amazing is that such a wonderful collection is in such a tiny rural town. Laurel is only, I think, 18,500 people. So it's really very small and sort of not quite South Mississippi, but mid-South Mississippi. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and then how such a wonderful collection got put in, in Laurel. Well, you know, we are, we are really a, um, a wonderful product of the, of the timber industry here in Mississippi. And so that is, uh, we're very fortunate that uh, Lauren's family came here. Uh, we were only incorporated here in Laurel in 1882. So, you know, you mentioned our size. And so we are not a, not a very big town uh, and fairly young compared to a lot of places in Mississippi. And we, um, when the railroads came through, it gave them a reason to, to kind of stop. But the main reason the thing it did is it gave us a reason to cut trees. And so the timber industry is what grew the area. And Eastman Gardner Lumber Company was the largest of the four sawmills. They came here beginning around eight, in the early 1890s and turned their first profit in 1896. And then in 1899, started building the beautiful historic district where we're located. And they kind of, kind of brought in a, a Midwestern sensibility, which is a little different from a lot of towns here in Mississippi and in the South. And so uh, Lauren was, grew up in that family. He was kind of next in line to take over the family business. business. And um, they um, uh, went to Princeton where he met his wife and he was actually building his house here uh, on the side of the museum when he died tragically of complications of an appendectomy. He was 23 when he passed away, it was 1921. And so a little bit of that in that Victorian context of making something good out of a tragedy, what can we do? And so in their minds, you know, they really thought had he lived, he was going to contribute greatly to Laurel. And so they, they were kind of products of the Gilded Age, his grandparents were particularly. And so, in, you know, in that era, it was really your public building said a lot about you. And kind of talked about, you know, so what did your, you know, your churches, your, your city hall, your courthouses, your libraries, your museums, it kind of ex talked about you and your civilization a little bit. And so what was, what was important to them uh, was education. And so uh, Laurel did not have a standalone public library at that point. Uh, it was actually upstairs of City Hall. And so they opened us in 1923, May 1st of 1923, as uh, not only an art gallery, but a public library. And we, were, we were actually built on the, what would be his home uh, that he was building for he, and it was actually gonna, it was a wedding gift from his parents, uh, directly across the street from the home he was, he was raised in. And so uh, we opened in 1923. There was one big addition in 1925. And so by that point, we were, we were pretty large. We were 18,000 square feet, which was, and as far as we know, we were kind of really the only museum of any kind in Mississippi. Uh, at that point, and uh, had a dual mission though from a library standpoint, and uh, we stayed a public library until the late 1970s. It, it didn't move out of our space downstairs until 1978, and then we renovated that space for more galleries. We've done a couple of additions, one in the 80s, and one about seven years ago in 2013. So we're now about 30,000 square feet uh, of gallery space, and you know, the other great part about that story is that the family, you know, besides the fact that it was for, for a lot for education, they also, luckily for us, uh, had a great interest in the visual arts. And they collected um, American European paintings. Um, Lauren's parents in the 1920s started collecting Japanese ukiyo-e woodblock prints. 
his great aunt, Catherine Marshall Gardner, collected Native American baskets. And so it's, it's a great variety of work. And so, you know, when people come, sometimes they're not sure exactly what, what they're going to find in an art museum. And for us, there's, we like it because it's kind of, there's a little something for everybody just about probably, whether you, whether you, you know, love paintings or, or, or love, you know, baskets or love Japanese prints, there's something there hopefully. And, uh, and, his, and his grandparents are the ones that, that not only um, started the painting collection, but they also gave the funds to build us. And so um, his grandfather um, basically said, you know, I'll, I wanna build it and I wanna start an endowment and through a foundation. And I don't ever want you to charge admission because I don't want anybody to not be able to come in and learn something because they can't afford to. And, you know, for Mississippi, that's been great for us because it's allowed generations and generations of, of not only local uh, school children and adults and patrons, but people from all over to come in for free. And it's a, it's a wonderful part of our mission and our history and kind of one of the things that we're probably one of the most things we're uh, most proud of. So. Well, that's fantastic. Um, okay, now tell me, how long have you been with the museum? Well, that's a, I've been here since 1993, actually. So I've been here about 27 years and I kind of, I backed into this job a little bit, uh, Bill. I was, I came here originally as director of development. I came here to do fundraising um, in the early nineties and the director that hired me left uh, shortly after I got here. And I was named acting director after that. And in 1994, took on the role as director, full uh, permanent director at that point. And so my, my background is not art. And so, you know, the, the good thing about, about that is that, you know, I don't really have any preconceived notions <laughs> about what, uh, so it's kind of all uh, been, a, it's been a great fun for me to, to learn and look. Um, but, you know, this is really a small business. You know, it's our, our operating budget is a little over a million dollars and we, we have to raise, you know, we have to raise almost half a million dollars every year to operate. And so uh, my background is actually in, in business. I have an accounting and computer information systems degree, a double major, and, and I have a master's in public relations. And so those kind of bode me well from a fundraising standpoint. And the art part, I can just kind of, I, I, I've learned as I, as I go along, but I was also smart enough, hopefully, to realize to surround myself with some good people that knew way more than I'll ever know about art. And that's kind of what I've been able to do uh, with the staff here. Okay. Well, that kind of helps me out because I was going to ask you how one became a director of a museum. Um, I didn't think that there was probably a degree in that, uh, but, but you've really, really laid it all out in that you're, you're running a business. And so having a, a business degree, um, possibly an accounting degree or whatever is really uh, public, uh, public relations, things like that, that that would be so important to being a director of a museum. It is. And that's been, you know, that's been kind of one of the, you know, because so much of what I, what the museum director does, whether I was at a you know, much larger institution or anywhere, you know, you're, you're working with boards, you're, you know, working with um, all kind of different funding sources. So many museums, we are not a government entity and we, we're not, we don't receive any funds from the city of Laurel, but, you know, most museums and most of, of my peers in the Southeast, a lot of them, know our city employees and they're having to work you know, in, within that political system with with different things and with budgets and so you know it's really kind of a it, it frees us it frees me up to be able to uh, spend time on those things because I enjoy that part of the process and it also allows us then to bring in you know other people to help us guest curators and visiting artists to, to take care of that part of it which is the, the other part of the fun part of it. Okay. A lot of people would then be asking, all right, so you're, you're the director, you're not a museum curator. So do you have a curator and what, what does a curator do? Right. We do. We have a curator. Kristen Miller's own has been our curator for gosh, about five years now, I guess she's, and it's kind of interesting. We, we've never, it's been a, through the years, we never really had, we only once in the history of the museum, was there a full-time curator? Our curators have always either been um, in the early days, sometimes they were part, they were director and curator together. Uh, we've had some part-time curators and that's kind of how Kristen's role has evolved with us. And so 
our permanent collection is so much a part of what we do. Uh, we do have temporary and traveling exhibitions, but so much of our um, identity is tied up into the, the, our five collecting areas. And so that's, and that's the bulk of our gallery space. And so from a curatorial standpoint, she interprets and she, uh, we've done some reinstallations of the galleries. We've done some things. We've, our American and European paintings are now hung salon style, and those are changes over the last couple of years. Um, and so those are, so the curator not only uh, interprets and our permanent collection, she also works with our, we have a committee that looks at acquisitions uh, because that's, you know, always something that people are looking at. How do you decide what artwork to buy or, or borrow or uh, steal? Uh, just kidding. So anyway, it is, how, how, you know, so she works with a committee and that's an educational component as well as how do we, um, how do we look at um, what we want to add to the collection or acquire. And then the other prong, other part of her job then is working with our temporary and traveling exhibitions. We, we host uh, any given year, anywhere from four to six temporary shows. Uh, I'm actually in the, in the middle of one, uh, actually in the middle of one now, which is a show that we are, we have on view, which is featuring, um, uh, these are all art faculty members from colleges and universities here in Mississippi. And so uh, there are 11 artists represented. They all teach. Um, and they're teaching it at, 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 from all around the state. It was a show that she juried. She visited. She looked at their artwork. And then she went and kind of uh, visited them in their studio space. And each of them was asked to pick a piece in our permanent collection. And they then to inspire them to then create something in response to that. And so those 11 different faculty members, um, are their work is hanging side by side with a piece from our permanent collection. So those kinds of things. And, and, you know, the other part of what a curator does is so interesting is that, you know, they have to, we work, you know, we work two or three years in advance. And so, you know, this show took a pretty good bit of time for us to, uh, for her to put together. And so she, you know, she met these artists probably two years uh, and pick them two years before the show actually opened. And so um, that's, that's the, the, the double part of what she does. And she's on site here. She actually lives in Columbus, Georgia. And, but she visits here and uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, an, a guest cottage, an overnight apartment here on, on site. With the, we have a historic house. So we have the museum and then across the street from the museum, we have the childhood home of, of Lauren that his parents built. And it's a beautiful, about a 7,500 square foot historic house. And we have offices there. And we also have uh, two different studio spaces for pottery and painting. And then we have an overnight uh, guest house. And so she comes in about one week a month. And the rest of what her time she spends with us is done remotely um, uh, from her home in, in Georgia. So it's really been a great, it's a great way for us to afford someone, uh, you know, that has a great background and then can do this. And... You know, as you mentioned early on, or as we've talked about, you know, Laurel's a small town. It's very, it's, you know, it's hard for us to attract someone to move here um, a lot of times as a curator. So it gives us the opportunity for her. She lives with her, and her husband has a, a great job. He's a, he's a guitar instructor at a, at a college in Georgia. And so he's able to stay there, and then she drives over, uh, like I said, about once a month. So. Well, um, you, you mentioned that your operating budget is about a million dollars a year. Without you know going into deep breakdown, what what's your main expense? What really eats up most of your budget? Well, you know, because as with a lot of museums, uh, so much of it is based is we're staff driven, and so uh, you know, about gosh, about forty percent of our budget is, are salaries. Uh, we've got um, a total on staff of about thirteen. Uh, three of them are part time. So full-time staff, and it's a pretty good variety. We've got, you know, we've got your usuals um, with the museum, but we've got, you know, we have two people full-time just in our education program. And so, because that's such a big part of what we do, uh, we have a curator of education or an outreach education coordinator. And so uh, a lot of our budget is based on that. Um, you know, I, I, people are always surprised. I tell them all the time, you know, 10% of our budget goes just to utilities. You could imagine uh, when you look at climate control in the South, which means constant temperature and constant humidity, 
Um, so we, we spend about a hundred thousand dollars a year just on utilities. And so it, it goes pretty quickly from there as you start breaking down, uh, insurance and temporary exhibitions and all the different aspects of, of kind of what we do. Well, I was also curious because I actually, uh, sometimes do art restoration or preservation, uh, a painting that's damaged or something like that. I actually repair them sometimes. And uh, so I was curious about, uh, do you have someone on staff or how do you deal with paintings or sculptures that have been damaged? And then I was thinking about your wonderful silver collection. Who polishes your silver? <laughs> you know, people ask us that all the time. So I'll, I'll take both of those questions. The, the, the silver, I'll take the silver one first. Uh, it's pretty easy. They are under uh, vitrines. And so they're kind of airtight. And so we were, they were polished about three years ago. We had them all rephotographed for a new catalog we printed. And so, um, and so because they're in vitrines and they're kind of airtight, they don't tarnish. And so we, I mean, really it will go 20 years without having to polish, uh, at a minimum. Sometimes it's not even that much. So really it, it's a little easier than it looks. And so with the silver, uh, the paintings, the paintings are kind of a whole different animal. We, we, we have a plan. We work with different conservators, our curator and our registrar uh, on staff. They work with, from a collection scare standpoint, they we've kind of identified those paintings that are, from a priority standpoint, need work. Um, you know, the good news is for most of our works in our permanent collection, they they've been in a very stable environment. Uh, you know, even even those that the family gave early on, they've been in a museum now almost a hundred years, and so fluctuations in light and temperature uh, in the environment are what kind of damage paintings a lot, and so. For us, we've been very fortunate. We do, it's a critical part of what we do. And, and as you mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, a part of our budget that people really don't ever see or know that, that it really happens because it's one of those that's kind of behind the scenes that there's not a lot of talk about. Um, and so we've identified those that are major pieces. And we've had them done through the years and we, we slowly have those worked on. But you know, if a painting goes out for conservation, it sometimes can be gone for a year. I mean, it just depends on the amount of work. A lot of it, not so much. What we find, tend to find now is that a lot of the work is just stabilization. It basically just needs a new liner. You know, you're not really trying, there's not a lot of, there's not much paint loss, but sometimes there may be some ripples or it may be coming off the stretcher. And so basically you just take that canvas, you take it off its original stretcher, put a new canvas liner behind it and then remount it a little tighter and that'll hopefully give it you know, a little, a little longer life. And as you know, if you've done this, you know, you really only want a conservator to do something that you can reverse. You know, they don't really do anything that's going to be permanent to that piece. It's more of something that can be re reversed out later if there's a problem. So the, the other was kind of fun and, and is that um, uh, we have, we're in the middle of actually a frame restoration project. And that is, really where we put a, a bulk of our money toward is committing to about a five-year plan to have our frames. A lot of them are older. You know, so many of the works we have in our collection uh, are framed in the original. They're you know, displayed in the original frames that the artist may be made. You know, so we have some frames from the 1800s, early 1900s that the artists themselves either built or had built. And you want to keep that original frame. Well, it's, you know, it's cheaper to buy a new frame, <laughs> but as a museum, we, we restore the frame that's there. And so we put a lot, it's a crazy amount of money we, are, we have started to having to put into uh, redoing framing. We just, matter of fact, just got back. We have a wonderful John Singer Sargent landscape and that frame has totally been redone and the original frame. We, we have a great little Winslow Homer painting the frame for that Winslow Homer was not original and it didn't look quite right with the piece. It's the piece that it's been, it's the frame it's been in for, for almost its entire life here at the museum. And so we actually bought a new frame for it, had a new frame built and made, you know, you don't really just buy one off uh, in stock. We have them redone. And so 
Um, we've actually got one, uh, there's actually a really good uh, framer here in the Southeast in Chattanooga. And they do a, a wonderful job of, of museum quality frames and restoring frames. It's, it's an art and craft all in itself, just like a conservator working on a painting, the framing um, uh, conservator is just as important. Okay, now you've mentioned you have five collections and I know you've got the uh, European art, American art, you've got your silver collection and the basket collection. What's number five? Uh, our, our Japanese woodblock print. Oh yeah, the woodblock printing. Um, could then, you just very quickly just sort of give us a rundown of, of, of those collections and maybe how you acquired them? We'll be happy to. Hey, do you mind if I walk around? Is that going to mess you up? Absolutely, please. Please. My background starts moving. That won't bother you too much. So I'll, I'll actually walk through um, uh, our temporary and traveling exhibition space. Uh, one of the fun things about this is being able to hopefully um, uh, take you through. So, yeah, of course, our big wall is our collection the bulk of this a lot of the works in this space of course we've added to through the years but so many of them um, are original pieces that we've had through the years i mentioned that it's hung salon style now and so these are works our earliest pieces are we have a couple of benjamin west portraits from um, the late 1700s and we kind of end in american impressionism and so we've got a huge selection of landscapes which is probably one of our more popular um, areas. It's a, the largest of our walls. So you've got everything from a, a beer stat to Thomas Moran to William Merritt Chase to our Sargent landscape on the end, which is um, really a nice piece. And it's kind of a, it's a fun one for us. A lot of times people ask me if I have particular pieces that I like more than others. And sometimes I like things for their stories more than anything. And so uh, this is the one I mentioned that has a brand new frame. But this, um, Sergeant Landscape, you can see the frame, how great it looks now, but this is actually, you know, people know his portrait, Madam X. Well, this is her backyard. So when he was painting her portrait, um, he actually painted the back of her estate uh, while he was painting that portrait of her. And so it's great. This was in the, one of those pieces that the family had. It actually went to a second generation and uh, it was given to us in around 1960. Uh, from somewhere in the family. And so, you know, this collection is kind of varied. You've got some, um, uh, one Mississippian in our landscape. This is Kate Freeman Clark from Holly Springs. Um, we've got some early pieces uh, from Mississippi in the end as well. So you'll see a Gaines Rugger Donahoe and a Richmond Barte at the very end. Uh, you'll also see some names that are familiar to Mississippians. You'll see, you know, there's a Marie Hull and a Carl Wolf and a Mildred Wolf and a William Hollingsworth. Um, on the end and so some of those are probably more more recent pieces that we've we've added to this particular gallery and so it's this has been the, the subject of really kind of how they started us so it was the american collection and the european paintings were the two gifts that that lauren's parents and grandparents uh gave us and so our smallest collecting area is our european collection and so it is the one area and really the one area that we really don't actively collect much anymore. It's kind of tough for us to acquire works from this era. Uh, we're great. We have a Rodin sculpture in the middle. that's actually on loan to us from the Hirshhorn. Uh, um, it's part of the Smithsonian. Uh, one of our more recent additions to this space is a great landscape by Eugene Boudin. Um, this was Monet's teacher. And of course, he is considered the father of Impressionism. Uh, Boudin is kind of the one that, that really kind of taught Monet to see light and, and to go outdoors on plein air and paint. And so uh, this piece was actually given to us in 1999 from the Sara Lee Corporation. They were giving away their American Impression collection and they picked states where they had significant business operations. And so Mississippi was chosen uh, because of, the, of uh, Brian Foods in West Point. And so then we were chosen as the museum in Mississippi to receive this painting. And so uh, it's been a great addition to us. Um, some from the Barbizon School, uh, some English landscape, some genre scenes, a few Dutch scenes. But Lauren's grandparents kind of had a greater interest probably in uh, the, the European works. And you got to remember too, Bill, the same with, with our American collection. You know, they, they, were, they weren't collecting these with the intention of having a museum. They were collecting these for their home. And so 
the scale on some are a lot smaller because they were, at the time, these were things they had hanging uh, in their house. And so through the, they had some larger ones, but we've been kind of adding a little bit to it uh, through the years, uh, a few pieces. But like I said, this is more of a static collection with us and that it's not one that we're going to actually uh, seek out. Most of our acquisitions now are going to be mostly uh, American works and primarily works probably from contemporary artists or works after 1950 even um, uh, to, in that era. So the third well, collecting area. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I actually learned something today. Uh, you know, the bulk of my career, I've been a portrait painter. And so John Singer Sargent among us portrait painters is, you know, he's in the pantheon of the gods. Well, mm -hmm. I did not realize that that landscape was the, the uh, Madame X's backyard. So that, yeah. that to me is fantastic. It, you know, and, and as a portrait painter, you, you, and you probably probably the same way as, as he was, you know, his, his passion was probably was getting to paint watercolors and landscapes, but that didn't pay the bills. And so, so many of those artists, you know, that were portrait painters had other loves uh, in terms of subject matter. And uh, for him, if you know much, and as you know all about him, that, you know, you realize his watercolors and landscapes were the ones that he really enjoyed getting to do because they were more for fun. They weren't part of the, of the business part of what he did. So yeah, it's a great piece. And it's, it's one of those stories that our, our docents love to tell that story because if someone comes in the museum, they may not know much about art or artists. They most likely have heard of John Singer Sargent. So we're kind of usually covered there. And if they've heard of him, a lot of them know that portrait. So it's kind of a fun way to tie it in. So yeah. 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 So, okay. So you were headed toward the um, silver collection. So, well, I'm standing at the door to the basket ah, collection first. All right, let's do the basket. Lauren's great aunt is Catherine Marshall Gardner. And she, before they moved here, actually, when they were still living in Clinton, Iowa in the 1890s, she read and, and really learned about Native Americans. She learned about Native American basket weaving. And she kind of garnered an interest in it. And then months moved here she they would travel in the summers i know this is going to come as a shock to you bill but uh they didn't really like the heat and humidity of the south uh in the summertime and so yeah. they would leave they would leave and would just you know take the train run a car go all over and so she would you know go all over north america that she actually traveled the world around the world two times in her lifetime but she had a great interest in native american baskets and so she started collecting. So our first official gift when we opened in 1923 was actually her collection of about 400 Native American baskets. And of course, you know, we're built on Choctaw land. And so we always talk about the Choctaw and, and kind of their front and center. When you walk into the gallery, we have a very large Choctaw fish trap, which is uh, a wonderful piece, a big made out of white oak. And really the only one we know of, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of to the era of the museum, early 1900s. And, but she also collected from just about every basket weaving tribe in North America. So we have 82 tribes in the collection and they represent just that's pretty much every tribe. If they were making baskets in 1900, she collected them in the, in the, in, for her personal collection, which she had actually in her home here, just uh, across the street and down the block from us here in Laurel. And again, collecting them, Really, for her home, she, she, she became a curator and was written up in journals and periodicals. But, you know, you know, Lauren's death kind of prompted then, wait, now I know I've got something I could do with them. And so we're very fortunate to be able to have this collection. It's also one of those collections that just about everybody, you know, can, can appreciate and look at. And so we, we have about 200 on view. Uh, of the collection. The collection itself now probably has about 550 pieces in the collection. Um, and we still actively collect. We collect a lot from the Southeast now more than anywhere. Um, a lot of times those are gifts to us. We are uh, always willing to, we, we've, we've got a really strong collection of Choctaw baskets. And so it also allows us then to loan some pieces out. And so another part of what we do as a museum and from a curator, what they do is we loan out pieces. And so we just had a selection of baskets from the Southeast, primarily uh, Choctaw that were at um, a museum in Abington, Virginia. And so we kind of just, you know, things like that throughout the year, 
requests come from time to time to borrow paintings. Uh, we loaned our Grandma Moses painting out recently to a museum. So just different museums, when they find out what we have in the collection, will call us and, and, or email us and ask us. So the next collecting area is one that, you know, in the South, people love their decorative arts. And so uh, this is a collection that actually was not started by the family. Of our five collecting areas, this is the only one that was actually started by um, this Thomas and Harriet Gibbons. They owned our local newspaper. And um, beginning in the 1950s, started collecting British Georgian silver. They were in, in England and found a piece by uh, someone named Gibbons. Actually, his name was John, John Gibbons, and that's his mark on the wall. And so they, um, these two tea caddies were pieces they collected and by him came back to Laurel, found out they weren't related, but kind of caught the bug and started collecting British George and silver. And so we're talking about the reigns of King George the first, second, and third. So about 1730 to 18, 1830 to 17, 1730 to 1820 and a little bit of everything. And so all around high tea. And so we've got, of course, a, a typical high tea setting with an epern in the middle. Uh, one of our newest pieces is uh, this piece that was just purchased with funds given in memory of someone who was a long time, who worked here at the museum for a while and then was a long time supporter. Her name is Betty Malloy. And this is a chocolate pot. So basically for hot chocolate and um, uh, kind of an early piece too. It was in the um, uh, early, excuse me, the late 1700s when it was done. And so it's a pretty good variety. And uh, the Gibbons family uh, was great. They had no children. So it was kind of, this became what they did. And we're, they were very, we were very fortunate to receive this as a gift from them um, uh, when they uh, passed away. And so. Um, re repeat for me, when you were saying that the uh, silver is in some sort of a hermetically sealed box mm -hmm. or something, Repeat that term you use because I wasn't quite understanding it, and tell me exactly what that means. Well, they are <clears throat> they're airtight, and so what happens is the the vitrines, because of the, the of the construction of these cases, uh, there's no air circulating, and the the silver does not tarnish, so it does not it will not tarnish, and so they stay airtight. The the, the exposure to air is what is going to make the silver turn. That's okay. why if you keep it, lot, that's why a lot of people keep their silver, you know, wrapped in a felt lining in a dark place, kind of in a closet, you know, and that's what will keep them. One thing that is interesting though, and most of these, some of these pieces may, a lot of them don't, uh, what people don't realize is you actually built, and you can actually uh, put a coat, you can actually wax silver. They make a wax for silver. So if you wanted to have it out all the time, and it wasn't, of course, under a, any type of, of case, then you could actually leave your silver out and it wouldn't turn, but of course you couldn't use it. So it would be, you couldn't put food or any type of beverage or anything <laughs> in your silver. So um, if there were pieces we had that were not under a, in a vitrine, then those pieces would have been waxed. Okay. <clears throat> and the wax process will leave it, you can leave them, you can leave them with wax on them for years as well and they won't tarnish. So. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right. So the, our last permanent collecting area are, is a collection of Japanese woodblock prints. And these were all collected by uh, Lauren's parents. Kind of interestingly, so the, Lauren dies in 21. We opened in 1923. And um, shortly after that, uh, in the mid, about 1925, Lauren's parents, they were friends with a, a couple in New Orleans. He was a doctor. And they that New Orleans couple collected Japanese woodblock prints from the ukiyo-e period. And so they then kind of got interested in them and put together a collection of Japanese woodblock prints. And you're only seeing a fragment. We only have out typically about 20 or so at a time. They're so light sensitive. We have about 170 in the collection and they change out with different themes. These are probably some of our more recent ones. You can tell by the vibrancy of the color and they are, um, uh, uh, some are kind of fun. So this is one that's kind of pretty famous from a Hiroshige. And so this is a fireworks over a, uh, over a bridge. And it's kind of fun because if you get into the detail of it, you literally can see the wood grain uh, in the images uh, when you go through them. And so they put this collection together. We've got Kabuki Theater, Beautiful Women, 
uh, scenes of nature. Uh, we've got different views of Mount Fuji, which is a pretty popular thing. Uh, one of the things they have, which is fun for us from an education standpoint, is they were able to actually get a set of wood blocks. Now, these are not, they're old. They're done about 1900. They're not original from when these works were done. Most of these works are 18th century, some 17th century. And uh, these are about from done in 1900, but it actually shows the woodblock print process. So it kind of can explain, you know, the image, how it's carved into the wood. It's a relief print. So basically we carve away and what's left up is what is inked and the print is made. So this shows you the stages of the print as it's through the process until you get to the very end. Um, and then the wood blocks, each wood block has a different theme that, that is added or part of the image that's added for a different color or shape. And the card in reverse. And so what's left up, like I mentioned, is what is ink. So the first time, of course, you see blue in the tail feather of this wood duck is here. So the wood block literally only contains the inking for those three tail feathers. And when you pop it out, you know, the blue shows up in the print. And so from an education standpoint, it's great to be able to show that process uh, to a lot of people that maybe not aren't familiar with kind of how prints are done in general, but you know, these were incredible. What's fun about these two is that it allows us to tie into our American collection a little bit because people don't realize um, people like Monet and a lot of American painters like Mary Cassatt, Japanese woodblock prints from this era were very inspirational to them, inspired a lot of, Jap of, of their work. And so we actually have our Mary Cassatt aqua tent is hanging in this particular space and it explains a little bit about you know, her passion for, for Japanese prints from this era and how they influenced her work. And so um, it's a good way to tie it back into our American collection somewhat. So anyway, so those are the five areas. So American European paintings, Native American baskets, British Georgian silver, and Japanese ukiyo-e with block prints. Yeah, and I see you've got some sculptures scattered around. Do you have what you would consider a collection of sculptures or do you just you know, just have different pieces sitting around. Yeah, we, we have different, but we don't have a, a set gallery for them. They're kind of in the place, kind of where they are. Early, the early pieces in the library collection, and they had actually in the library and then to the museum, uh, the family collected some pieces by Anna Hyatt Huntington. So we've got several different sets of, of mostly animals, which is kind of what she was known for. Um, they collected some Native American imagery. We've got two or three sculpture that uh, feature Native American chiefs or, 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 or members from uh, that era in them. We have, this is Richmond Barté, who is a Mississippi artist, who is you know, probably the most famous Mississippi uh, sculptor there was. And he was an African-American sculptor born in Bay St. Louis and studied at the Art Institute of Chicago and has pieces all over. And so he's you know, pretty prominent. And so we have a few, it is, not an area we collect a lot of. We have a couple of pieces that are outside. Uh, we have a couple on our front lawn that are outdoor sculpture. Um, we have a couple of pieces in storage that we don't have out all the time. We have a very big, bold, fun, contemporary piece by Ida Kohlmeyer, who was a New Orleans artist. And so um, uh, they're kind of, uh, it's, it's, they're top of mind and that sometimes we do collect them. Um, purchase them from time to time. Some are gifts. It just depends. The last collections purchased for a sculpture, though, the purchase we bought would have been probably the, um, um, uh, the Richmond Barté. We also bought an Elizabeth Catlett sculpture as well about that same time. And so uh, well, this is really interesting. This helps me to transition back a little bit to the business of a museum, talking about the collections. When you're acquiring pieces, um, well, first of all, like with shows, do, do museums compete with one another or is this sort of working hand in hand, like with traveling shows or, uh, you know, if there's a real hot artist or a commodity that maybe different museums are all vying for, um, how does, how does all that world work? Well, you know, it, it's, there's probably not as much, you know, in our world where we are, there's not as much competition for it, I would think. You know, we're not, you know, in, in New York City, yes, I would could see that that would be an issue. Here in, in the South, not as much. We, there are things that come up from auction from time to time that might have a tie to us or a tie to Mississippi 
and we may bid on it, but that's very rare that that actually happens. And so, um, you know, we acquire, we're very selective. We don't have a lot of money to buy things. And that's kind of our, you know, our, our one area that we, we, you know, when we talk about our million dollar operating budget, our income comes from a variety of sources, but our primary income, uh, half of our budget, half a million dollars, we self-generate. It comes through a foundation that the family established. And so the Eastman Memorial Foundation was started by Lauren's parents, grandparents. And, um, but the funds that are in that are typically for operations. And we only, they don't really, throughout the history, didn't really have money set aside to buy things. So we've been very, very selective. Uh, we do it through donations. We do now have one uh, endowment fund uh, that we use to uh, purchase artwork. And so, and trying to tell you how that works from a, the, the accounting hat comes on real quick for me. So if we have a million dollars, we could, we say we only use 4% of that a year for budgeting purposes. That's what most nonprofits use 4% of their, whatever their endowment is. So that means we have $40,000 to spend every year to buy something. Well, that doesn't go far in, 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 from an art standpoint, particularly when you're looking at major pieces that we've got to add to the collection or that we do add to the collection. And so uh, we try to build that up. We try to get, we have memorial gifts that come in. It's an area that we, we, we fundraise for acquisitions uh, just like we do anything else. And sometimes we're given um, um, of a quest that maybe doesn't have a string attached to it. And then the, foundation then our museum board will say ooh let's you know if they don't have a sole purpose for it let's use it to buy something that that's major for the collection and we had to do that um with we did that with a piece uh we have a dale chihuly glass sculpture that hangs in in our stairwell gallery and this piece was purchased strictly from a gift from a bequest we had gotten a gift in and we kind of held on to it and it took us a while, took us years to decide what to do with it. And the board decided to buy one of his pieces. And that's what hangs in our, in our stairwell gallery um, in this particular space. And so, you know, something like this was purchased from a gallery, uh, actually the Arthur Roger Gallery in New Orleans. And it was part of an exhibit that uh, Dale Chihuly had and actually had part of an exhibit there in 2008 and it did not go back to Seattle where he is. And so it stayed in, in storage there in New Orleans and we knew we wanted to buy something. And so, you know, different people had looked at it as a possibility to add it to their collections. And then we kind of pulled it, uh, uh, decided to, to make it a purchase for us in 2013. And so um, not so much at auction, but more just kind of selective pieces that we get from time to time. And then we're very fortunate because we have, we have some artists that will um, donate to us. They have, we have a kind of a wish list of maybe some pieces we, we look at. Um, our last big major purchase uh, is a piece that's actually not on view right now, but Bo Bartlett is a kind of important contemporary painter uh, in the, from the South, but kind of known nationally. And he's got a huge reputation and we just bought a, a big, big major piece by him. Uh, and added to the collection. Um, African-American artist from Georgia, Charlie Palmer, who has kind of become famous now. And we, we have a new piece by him that was a portrait he did. And so it just kind of depends on, um, sometimes it's from an exhibit, sometimes it's just an artist that our curator and our collections committee has been looking at. Okay, and in an overall sense, what do you see the purpose of a museum like the Lauren Rogers? What's its purpose for the community? Well, and that's a good question. You know, and, and, the, and the thing now too, Bill, is that museums are changing and kind of what, what we are and, and kind of what we do. Um, and they actually started changing this year, even um, in a lot of bigger cities and urban areas in particular. So, you know, our mission has always been about education and you know, our goal is, you know, the, the theoretical, the theoretical uh, goal of a museum is to transform lives, which you know, every grant, every grant has to have that word in it, I think sometimes. But from us, it's really all about accessibility. And, and, and the beauty of being free is that we've been able to allow people to come in. And, you know, if one person comes in and it inspires them to maybe become an artist or study art or just appreciate and learn more. Um, and it, and it kind of opens their minds up. I mean, 
you know, think about the, the number of school children that have come in and especially with our Native American basket collection. I mean, it, it really gives them an opportunity to, to explore and understand the culture that they think is dead, but they don't realize that we have Choctaw living all around them here in Jones County. We have a Choctaw reservation, you know, seven miles from the museum. And so we try to make sure that they are from an education standpoint, they, they kind of see something and it, maybe that inspires them and something they like. We also, um, from an accessibility standpoint, it's great for us to have um, different and varying opinions of, of certain pieces. You know, there's something that's here for everybody. And so we try to, try to get them to, to see that. And that's, you know, our, our, over our front door, we've got a beautiful Tiffany bronze plate that was a stab that was put in originally in 23. And it says, you know, in memoriam, Lauren Eastman Rogers for the advancement of learning. And that really kind of is the focus of what we try to do. And so museums interpret, we care for objects, we interpret, we educate, you know, and now museums are being asked to be more like community resources as well. You know, we kind of need to, you know, what's, what's our role in interpreting the place where we, where we exist and where we live. And so a lot of bigger museums, especially in urban areas, are having to look and rethink their mission somewhat to be, what do we, um, uh, from a, from especially in, in 2020, from a COVID standpoint, from a Black Lives Matter standpoint, you know, what are we interpreting from the, our surroundings and the people that we say we're collecting for? And so um, I think that role is gonna change uh, through the years, but you know, the historically the role has been, we collect things, we interpret them and we preserve them because, you know, centuries, you know, we're looking at things, we have things in the museum that were three, 400 years old, and we want people to be able to see them three or 400 years from now as well. Right. Well, then that leads, since you mentioned COVID, how has that changed your daily operation? How has it changed your uh, fundraising and so forth? Well, you know, like everyone else, we closed, you know, for several months. We, op we actually opened back up uh, the 1st of June and... Um, you know, we're being in a small town where we are able to, to do things a little differently. Probably we don't, we're not overrun with visitors, which kind of is, is nice, but, you know, being a large space, people keep their distance and we ask everyone to wear a mask. And so that part has been, has, has worked out well. Um, interestingly enough, you know, a lot of the, most museums, the, you know, one big issue with being closed is they have no admissions. And so many museums rely on tickets and people paying to come in. Well, with us, that's not an option. So from a budget standpoint, um, we didn't really take much of a hit with that because uh, fundraising, we did not, we weren't, we don't really do a lot in, in, in the spring anyway. Our new fiscal year started June 1, which meant we have a membership drive. And I'm really pleased to say that uh, so far, our membership campaign for this summer is almost about what it was last year. So I think people see kind of what we did and what COVID allowed us to do was kind of rethink how we deliver our product. And so not only are we doing more videos and you know, uh, we're taping interviews with artists, we're doing kind of what you and I are doing and letting people learn about different parts of the collection where our curator interviews artists that we have in the collection. We also started producing art kits. We had, you know, we had, even when we were closed, we would put a card out front and parents and grandparents could come by and get a self-contained kit with art activities for kids to do. And we would do hundreds a week with that. And so I think people saw that we were, you know, kind of uh, still able to create our mission and do some things and be a part of the community. And so from a COVID standpoint, that's been a, a big part of it has been um, getting back open and making sure it's a safe environment not putting our staff at risk. And so, of course, we don't have meetings. We don't have our docents and volunteers here. We're not having any events, you know, uh, not going to really have any type of children's festivals. We don't have art talks or gallery talks or receptions. So we're trying to find a new way to deliver those products and to do more things um, online or taped with interviews. And I think that's kind of going to be kind of the new norm for us, at least through this calendar year. Uh, it will affect our fundraising from our gala standpoint. One of our biggest sources of income is an annual gala that we do every year in December. And of course, that event will be totally changed. It will be an online auction. 
and um, it usually brings in it brings in close to a hundred thousand dollars for the museum and you know we're not sure how that's going to what it will look like this year but uh, we'll we'll find out in a few months when we have to do it but it will be a, a new challenge for us. Okay um, well you know that's really got the questions I had for you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with with the uh, with my audience about your your museum and what's going on? Uh, well you know it, it's what's fun for us quickly is that we, we did we mentioned a little bit about our temporary and traveling exhibits and so just know that even though our permanent collections are so much a part of what we do we do try to change exhibits out from time to time and so uh, always check our website and look at what might be coming up or what we have on view uh, as they change out. The, most of our shows up this fall will all end in November and then in January we'll kind of start reinstalling and putting in some new exhibits uh, throughout. You know one of the fun things too is if people want to come visit is that you know Laurel's changed a lot. Uh, we're very fortunate to have an HGTV show uh, filmed here and that particular show has um, created a buzz nationally, of course, but it's also brought a lot of tourists in. And so what's been great about the museum is that our exposure now has, has changed so much. And almost all of our visitors now are from out of state on a regular basis. And so uh, people come to Laurel not only to see in, in the historic district and visit downtown and learn about the show, but the good news is, is we're right, right in the middle of it. And uh, we're getting just so many visitors that come in and have a new appreciation uh, for not only for the museum, but for visual art in general um, because of the show. And so it's been kind of a nice thing for us to be able to, to tie into that and piggyback on the success of that TV show. All right. Well, thank you, George. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Bill. Anytime. I'd love to do it again. Just let me know. Yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm the Arthropologist. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.